Welcome to The Screen Queen, the show where I'll be talking about your favorite show or your favorite movie. You'll just have to find out what you're about to know. This is your Screen Queen, your host, Samantha Parrish. Hello there and welcome to the show. My name is Samantha Parrish and I am the host of The Screen Queen. I am the one woman show and I put the move in movie. And that tagline definitely holds up considering the movie that I'm going to be talking about for this episode. First Blood is one of the most important movies of my life. This has an integral part in my life because Rambo is a big part of my family. This is a series that my mother and I bond over a lot, and it's kind of funny to have to address that, that my mother and I are Rambo fans, so she was very excited to be able to share this with me, but it was more than just sharing the action. There was a lot of heavy lessons in Rambo that became my way to understand more about life through Rambo. My mother and I would often quote the movies, and she even has a Rambo action figure that she showed me after I watched the Rambo series, and she legitimately told me that if I lost the tiny little knife that came with the tiny little Rambo, then, well, I had a nice life. It was it was good while it lasted. Twelve years was a nice run. <laughs> I never thought that a movie like Rambo would impact me so much, and it's been a movie series that I do rewatch, and it's something that, it's like that saying, it's a movie that lives in my head rent-free. There are moments that feel more larger than life, and getting to rewatch the Rambo series really changed the way I saw Rambo than when I first saw First Blood at 12 years old and then watching at 27 years old and finding more to appreciate about the movie. And with that said, I found more to appreciate with the rest of the movies, which is why I had to change the game plan for this episode and title it The History of Rambo. As I began watching more from the movies and seeing things I never saw before, to put together for a very valid, interesting commentary to bring about Rambo. And in my research, there wasn't a lot that I saw that matched the commentary that I wrote for this episode. And I really want to share this to see if there are others that found these very interesting parts to the evolution of the character of Rambo, how they feel about it. There's there's a lot to unpack about Rambo, which is why we're going to go ahead and dive into the history. But with that said, this is the first episode that I have to say is going to have some major spoilers. Normally on the Screen Queen, I keep this show relatively spoiler-free, so that way I don't deprive the experience to the viewer that wants to go watch the movie for themselves if they have not watched this this movie or TV show. So with this said, you're going to have to pause this episode, go find the movies or rewatch the movies and then come back because Rambo is something that you do need to experience. I'm not one of those people that says you haven't lived it until you've seen this movie, but this is a very important movie for what it brought, not just to the world of cinema, but to our humanity as well. And it's weird to say it like that, but when I get into the commentary, it'll make sense. So we're going to start off with the first movie, which is First Blood. Now, before I get into talking about the movie for First Blood, I have to talk about the book First Blood. First Blood is entirely different. The Rambo that we see in cinema is way different than the Rambo that was depicted in the First Blood book that was written in 1972. First Blood was written by an author named David Morrell. And the Rambo that we know today is not the Rambo that was in that book. The Rambo that was originally written was a psychopath. I'm dead serious. Rambo was a lean, mean killing machine with no heart, no remorse, just lived to kill. And then when Rambo was developed into a movie... 
Sylvester Stallone took the helm and worked with David Morrell to make Rambo sympathetic than psychotic. David Morrell was surprisingly okay with that and gave a stamp of approval to Stallone to recreate the character of Rambo and actually said in many interviews that he does prefer the way Rambo was rewritten. That's kind of a rarity for many authors to be okay with the screenplay changing the way the original vision came about. And honestly, it's a good call. With the timing of First Blood coming out, it serves as a time capsule. With First Blood's plot about a Vietnam vet, this became the gateway film to finally address the ghosts of the Vietnam War. I don't really know much about that time period of war movies in the 1970s and into the 1980s, but can you really name another film that tackled Vietnam like Rambo did? I don't quite know, but Rambo is the only one that comes to mind, and it's the only one that's ever mentioned. The plot of First Blood follows Rambo as he's trying to acclimate back to society after doing his time in the military. Now, here's the problem. He can't acclimate back to life because there is a cop that decides that he doesn't belong in his town. A judgmental cop named Will Teasel doesn't like the way Rambo looks because he's got long hair and he looks scruffy looking. All Rambo wanted to do was just go into town, get a burger, find a job, and that was it. And Teasel had to be the one to kick him out of town just because of what he looks like. The first scene in Rambo does set the stage for what's going to happen, that these two men are essentially going to be the hero and the villain. And this can be kind of taken either way. Teasel's just doing his job, but he's also abusing his job. He thinks that this town is his town, when he's really just the sheriff. Yet he thinks he's got all the power to kick someone out of town and flat out judge them because of what they look like. It's an awful, disgusting, and uncomfortable thing, but it's not an uncommon thing. To see that in Rambo, it does serve as an example of people that do abuse their power. And in this case, it just bites Teasel right in his ass. Teasel is one of those characters that, you know that the whole plot could have been avoided if he didn't judge Rambo, but unfortunately he did, and he brought it on himself. Throughout the many beginning parts of the film, you do see how Teasel abuses his power and in turn what it does to Rambo. In the beginning, when they're prepping Rambo to be documented as a criminal, they're getting him shaved, and unfortunately, the razor triggers Rambo to a PTSD episode when he was a prisoner of war. And it's one of those moments that you see where the other characters have no idea why in the world Rambo is screaming and writhing in pain and screaming in terror. But unfortunately, due to their arrogance and incompetence, they fail to see that. Except for like one cop that sees something. But other than that, everyone else brushes it off. And damn, it's their fault for doing so in the first place. They got an ass whooping that they deserved. Rambo was doing what he had to escape this situation but it's a reaction to what is a very strong parallel to what he went through it's a natural reaction and with the ptsd scene that is depicted it does make an example of what that looks like it's one of the many examples of ptsd throughout first blood in the course of the events of the movie, Teasel and his men are trying to go get Rambo and they fail every single time because they have no idea what they're messing with. Until a man named Colonel Troutman comes to town. And now I gotta take a moment to talk about Colonel Troutman because he is one of the most integral parts to this episode because of his relationship to Rambo. Without Colonel Troutman, there would be no Rambo. But it also speaks to say that without the character of Colonel Troutman, there would not be a lot of outside information to be known about Rambo from another character. When you look at the entirety of the Rambo series, it's called Rambo. It's a solo character. 
when we look at ensemble movies like Star Wars or Lethal Weapon, we have characters to choose from. With Rambo, that's pretty much it. With Colonel Troutman, he is one of the most important characters in the Rambo franchise. He's the man that made Rambo. That just shows you how much of a very lethal man Colonel Troutman is to make a man like Rambo, and that he's made others like Rambo as well. Teasel says that everything is handled and everything's okay, and that they'll handle Rambo, and Colonel Troutman says the best line that makes it priceless. He tells Teasel, I didn't come here to save Rambo from you. I came here to save you from Rambo. That's a, that's a hell of a line knowing the damage is far from done. But unfortunately, the damage that Rambo is doing, it's a mishmash of different emotions. Rambo's not well. Rambo feels that he's hopeless. He feels that he's a lost cause. There are other moments in the first, in this first film that he expresses that he doesn't really know how to acclimate. He doesn't know what to do. Everyone he knows is gone. Rambo's identity is very lost. He's trying to acclimate back to a life that doesn't want him and he doesn't know why when all he did was serve his country. And this is the thanks he gets. There's a very haunting line that Rambo says when Colonel Troutman tells him that it's over. And Rambo says, nothing is over. Nothing. You just don't turn it off. It wasn't my war. You asked me, I didn't ask you. That whole dialogue, it encapsulates what Rambo has gone through since he came back from the Vietnam War as well as the fact that it talks about his PTSD when he says, you just don't turn it off. He's right. You don't. It wouldn't surprise me if they ever used this snippet of that scene to describe what that feels like. There are many definitions to talk about trauma, and the one line that Rambo says does encapsulate that. It's haunting and it's heartbreaking, but it's accurate. When I first watched that scene, when, oh God, here we go. Here comes the waterworks. When I first watched that scene at 12 years old, it was the first time that I understood PTSD. I'm sorry, I have to talk about this for a little bit, but watching First Blood was the first time that I understood something that I never knew before. There were many things that I would get emotional during movies like death and heartbreak, but this was something different to see someone suffering and no one knew about it. And to know the entirety of the movie, this man has been suffering so much. And it's heartbreaking for what he went through. And to know that there's other like Rambo out there, which makes it really hard to see. And then, oh, excuse me, sorry. Gosh. Oh, it never failed to um, make me cry when I was 12. So it makes sense that it's going to make me cry when I'm 27. Ooh. And, um... When I first watched that, I just didn't even know that I was crying. When he continues to talk about the war going on in his mind of what happened to his friend, watching his friend explode and trying to put his friend back together. And he said he thinks about it every single day. And that is what trauma is. When something terrible happens, it it will be on your mind every single day. As someone that deals with trauma and still thinks about it every day, That scene can be seen in any context, in any way, of what it feels like to go through trauma. Okay. Rambo is essentially known for being an action flick that has things exploding and guns going off and arrows fighting. But this is what sets this action film apart from the other action movies, is this heartbreaking commentary. It wanted to show you this part that needed to be addressed. It was like a whistleblower in a way. And there's going to be more moments that I'll be talking about how Rambo became like this voice for many topics that had a hard time to be addressed because it just couldn't find a voice anywhere. And Rambo essentially became that voice. So now that 
I talked about that. I'm going to go ahead and do a couple of closing points about First Blood. First Blood is such a powerful film, and I have to talk about Stallone for a little bit because it's in my notes, and I feel like it has to be talked about. Stallone really does carry this film. Without him, there would be no Rambo. There were many other people that were given the opportunity to play Rambo, but but Stallone knew what to do for this film. How to make Rambo more than just an action movie. He made this into a powerful drama topic. That's also an action film, but rarely do you have a film that can balance itself in being drama and action. It was a great film for Stallone, considering all that was writing for him was Rocky. And unfortunately, there's only so many times Rocky can win the fight or lose the fight, and you cheer for him in the end. This is a film where you don't really cheer for Rambo. You want him to be okay. You want him to find some help. You you hope that things are going to work out for him. Many action heroes, you kind of know they're going to be okay. They walk off into the sunset. They get the girl. Rambo just needs help. I can't think of any other action movies where you wanted that for the character, aside from maybe Martin Riggs from Lethal Weapon, but that's another episode that we'll talk about. Now, with that mentioned, this is something that I had to think about in the timeline of Rambo's history. There aren't any more times that you do see this happen again. You just have to know that it exists, that Rambo has PTSD and that he's dealing with it. But it is kind of strange that you never really see the follow-up. It's just going to have to be hinted that he gets help. It's not exactly the way to do it, but it was a film that was ahead of its time, and addressing it was about as much as it was going to go far. There would eventually be other movies and TV series that would eventually unpack it, but you got to start somewhere. There was actually a film that I talked about um, in another episode called In the Line of Fire, where that was also a film that addressed PTSD, and that was a film that came out in 1993. Look at Rambo's time placement in 1982, coming out and talking about PTSD. I can't think of any other film before 1982 that took the helm to make these different definitions to express and define what PTSD is to teach people to help those that are struggling with the battle in their own mind. Another thing to think about with the character of Rambo that honestly does set the stage for the rest of the film is that Rambo has often been compared to Frankenstein. With the events of First Blood, there is a bit of a strange parallel to Frankenstein, if you really look at it. If you make the comparisons to other characters, Rambo's been compared to Frankenstein. Colonel Trotman has been compared to the scientist that made Frankenstein. Colonel Trotman made Rambo. So it does really make a lot of sense about First Blood. I'm not quite sure if that was a inspiration behind the creation of First Blood. But it is something to keep in mind when you watch the film. The first film ended with him surrendering in the town, and Colonel Trotman takes him away, so you pretty much just know Colonel Trotman's gonna take care of him. That's a pretty good wrap-up, but we still got Rambo First Blood Part 2 to see what's going on with him. And that was a big question. What's gonna happen to Rambo in the second movie? What are we gonna see more about his character? And the next part that I'll be talking about, it is really culturally accurate that the way people remember Rambo is honestly the next film, which is Rambo First Blood Part 2. The second movie opens up with Rambo doing his time in prison, and then he is offered time served if he comes to do a mission. Even though people look at the second film really just as a fun action movie where you do go see Rambo in his raw, natural element in his surroundings, there is a lot that speaks to his character. There's a specific scene that I'm going to talk about before Rambo goes on his mission. He talks to Colonel Trotman, and he basically tells Colonel Trotman that he's onto some bullshit about this whole mission. 
That shows how much Rambo is a very smart person, that he reads between the lines so well, and he knows he's being used, and tells Colonel Trotman, you are the only one I trust. Even though there's not many scenes with him and Colonel Trotman in this film, that one scene shows you exactly how their relationship is, that no matter what happens, he thinks of this man as a father, and he trusts Colonel Trotman more than anybody in the world. That speaks volumes about Rambo's character, especially from the first film where he was judged so fast just because of his hair and the way he looks. And then you see him in his element where he does get a little bit vulnerable. He does talk to other characters. He's a character that was unfairly criticized. So in a way, the second movie does strangely make up for what happened to him in the first movie, even though... Oh boy, Rambo's still going to go through some shit, but at least it's some shit he can get himself out of. Because he's Rambo. There are many elements to the second film that could have used a little bit more work. I have mentioned that there are moments that you do have to read between the lines to know that there's more to Rambo's character. But the one thing that I was very surprised that they left out for this film was not talking about Rambo's PTSD. And I mean that with a certain part that surrounds the plot where he's going to go rescue American POWs. When I watched this movie again, I felt like that was a missed opportunity. The first film talked about PTSD. This could have been a good way to maybe have Rambo open up a little bit more about what it was like for him being an American POW. And I'm honestly surprised in some of the scenes where he was captured and tortured that it didn't jar any memories, just like it did in the first film when he was in the police station being unnecessarily interrogated. And I think that hurts the film because it doesn't have the strongest rating. Some people were a bit unfair to it back in 1985. It does have a little bit more fairness in the reviews today where some people see that it's not as bad as people think and it is smarter than it looks. But if they did something with the PTSD and the American POW talk, this could have really elevated people to take this film more seriously. Even back in 1985. I don't know if anyone else ever caught on to that as to why Rambo truly is smarter than it looks, but it's something I felt like it had to be mentioned for the history of his character. At the end of the second Rambo movie, there is a very powerful speech that Rambo makes about how much he loves his country, that there's been a lot that has happened to him with his PTSD and the way he was treated in the first film, and yet, after everything he's been through, and after the events that he went in this mission, he still loves his country and gives the most powerful speech that, I swear to you, it kind of rivals... Bill Pullman's Independence Day speech, and this was in 1985, way before 1996. There are some great patriotic speeches out there, but my God, the thing he says in that movie, it is beautiful. At the end of the second film, Rambo just walks off, and it could be seen as something a little bit cliched or even a bit funny that a man's going to walk off without even a frickin' shirt on, but he's Rambo when he's hot, so it's okay. Rambo's resourceful. That's what's always been known. So what was going to happen to him in the third movie? The third film does provide a lot of interesting insight to Rambo's character. Even though the third film is not really praised as much as it should be, there's something that went unnoticed that needs to be talked about. In the first two films, Rambo is just trying to find himself. As cliched as it is, the man is lost. All he knows how to do is fight, and he has a fight in his own mind. That's been clear in the first two films. In the third film, there is a bit of peace to Rambo. In the third film, we find Rambo in a small village, where he's currently doing some stick fighting to make money for the village that he's staying at. Now, even though this is a very small segment of this very long movie, this actually does speak a lot about Rambo's character and his history. In the first film, Rambo is trying to find his placement in society. That, of course, backfires with Sheriff Teasel being an absolute dickface. 
And then in the second film, things backfire on him again, where he's going on a mission. He's in his element, and he's betrayed by the people that he's supposed to be protecting. Now Rambo is in a country, in a village, and he's absolutely at peace. He can still use his fighting skills, but it's not for killing. He can do some stuff around the village, and it's not for money. Everyone seems to enjoy having Rambo there because of the way that he provides for them and they provide for him. It's a good win-win situation for Rambo, but, you know, Rambo's got a Rambo, so we're going to be seeing Rambo in action. The third film follows Colonel Trotman coming back to get Rambo for a mission that he's going on. So I got to put a quick pause button on Rambo's character and go back on to Colonel Troutman because this is very important, and I never noticed this until after I rewatched the third Rambo movie. Colonel Troutman has been known as the man that made Rambo. So what does Colonel Troutman's skills look like? Honestly, that sounds like the perfect plot to Rambo 3 is having that question answered. What's Colonel Troutman like in the field? What does he do? How? What are all these skills that he taught Rambo, and how are they utilized? It's going to be an interesting insight, and honestly, that does make for a very solid story for the whole entirety of the Rambo series. Because again, you only have two characters. You have Rambo, and you're going to have to have someone that can validate how Rambo came to be, and that's Colonel Troutman. So with this film being focused on saving Colonel Troutman, this does give Rambo a major motive. This is a very important person to him, and that is a very valid reason for him coming out of his quote-unquote retirement to go get the man that is basically like his father. Everything that has been known about Colonel Troutman comes to light in this movie, and watching him work with Rambo is fantastic. But with the fact that it's the third Rambo series focused on him and Colonel Troutman, there is a bit of a sad thing to think about. It's the last time that Colonel Troutman would ever be seen. Unfortunately, in the years to come, the actor that played Colonel Troutman, Richard Crenna, had passed away from cancer in 2003. So there would be no more Colonel Troutman. And Richard Crenna did make an impact on the Rambo series as well as Sylvester Stallone's life. So when the fourth movie came up, this does beg the question, how is Rambo going to be without the only man that ever taught him everything he knows in life, the man that saved him on numerous times. What was going to happen to Rambo? He really is all alone in the world. And that's where the fourth movie comes up, is what happened to Rambo all these years, having no Colonel Troutman? Is he still fighting? Is he dealing with his PTSD? There was a lot of questions that were answered when Rambo had the follow-up film in 2008, 20 years after Rambo 3. Before I talk about Rambo's character in the fourth film, there is a piece of trivia that I would like to share about what happened to Colonel Trotman's character in the fourth movie. During the production, when it was greenlit that Rambo was coming back for a fourth movie and Sylvester Stallone was the one to direct it, there were some actors that came forward that wanted to play Colonel Troutman. One in particular was the actor James Brolin. He approached Stallone and he said that he would be honored to play Colonel Troutman and that he would do whatever it is that he could do to portray Colonel Troutman to the way he was portrayed by Richard Crenna. Very honorable thing. Sylvester Stallone's answer was this. I appreciate the offer, but there is only one Colonel Troutman. If that doesn't speak volumes about honor towards someone else, I don't know what the hell is honor. This is like the textbook definition of honoring someone, and it's so sweet and amazing and wow. Whew. Still get emotional thinking about it. In the progress for Rambo's character, we follow Rambo 
into another country. So it has a bit of like a same parallel to what happened in the third film. But this also does have a parallel to the first film where Rambo is still lost and lonesome. Because it's never really addressed that Colonel Troutman died, you just have to assume it for yourself that you know why Rambo is so brooding and sad is because he doesn't have anybody else. Everyone else that he loved is dead. It's not really known about his family at this this point. It's never been talked about his parents or siblings or anything. All he's ever had was Colonel Troutman. So it does make sense to his character that he would be doing something by himself in a very dangerous part of the jungle, but also being in a village where he can pretty much do his own thing, contribute to the village, and pretty much be left alone. It doesn't particularly work out that way when Christian missionaries come for his aid to take them to Burma. Now, this is another side note. This was something that I learned when I watched Rambo on uh, AMC when they had a series called Story Notes. They filmed Rambo about 30 minutes or 30 miles away from the location of Burma. It's said in the trailer, Burma is a war zone, and they weren't kidding. During the production of Rambo, there were numerous times that the entire cast and crew had to drop to the ground and be quiet as possible because of the fact that real Burma soldiers were coming through. So when you look at this, with Rambo being a fourth film to continue the character of Rambo, this was also a whistleblower film to talk about how dangerous of a country Burma is. It put it on the map to be talked about for another dangerous country that needs help. It's a pretty impressive film to bring back a series, but also make an impact. Throughout the events of the fourth movie, there is a change in Rambo's character where he does go out of his way to help the Christian missionaries get to Burma despite the warnings. That does show a lot about his character that he might seem gruff and a little hard-edged, but after the past three movies, can you blame him? And for the fact that 20 years have gone by, who knows what the hell Rambo has seen since Colonel Trotman's passing. He has to be closed off for a reason, and it's shown. And he also knows what he's doing. So for these Christian missionaries to keep poking and prodding about wanting to make a change when Rambo has told them, you're not changing anything, it's not happening. And it was seen as negative, but Rambo's not wrong. There's a lot that Rambo has seen, and he doesn't want to tell these Christian missionaries what they're about to see because it will mess up their minds. I mean, unfortunately, in the events of the Rambo movie, something bad does happen to the Christian missionaries because of their own negligence to heed the warnings, and it is up to Rambo to save the day. That is essentially the plot of the fourth Rambo movie, but the one thing that I appreciate in this movie is that they do circle back to Rambo's PTSD which does a lot for the continuation of his story. There's a scene where Rambo is having a, a nightmare, and he's going back to the events of what happened in the first movie back in 1982 when he was in Hope, Washington. This nightmare sequence does have a callback to what Rambo said in the first movie, where he says, you don't turn it off. This is the evidence for the past 20 years, Rambo has never been able to turn it off. It has existed with him for so long, even now where he's kind of content in this country. He's still not over his PTSD. And then this dream, nightmare, it's honestly a nightmare because it's his trauma being repeated and rewound in his mind. Like he said, you just don't turn it off. So unfortunately, not even his dreams can give him comfort. And the nightmare sequence ends with Rambo shooting himself. Now, this is a side note, because this is really important to know. This part of the sequence where Rambo shoots himself was the alternative ending to the first Rambo movie. That moment there... 
means that we wouldn't have never had the series. So it is unique that this unused scene is used to show how much Rambo is suffering. It's it's awful. But there is one tiny positive part to that scene is we get to see Colonel Troutman again. Because of Richard Crenna passing away in real life, there was never going to be a recast for Colonel Troutman. So to have this archive footage of Richard Crenna, it's a nice nod. And it does keep Colonel Troutman in the film, as well as having it present for how much Rambo misses him. So the rest of the movie goes on. And honestly, I can't really give away the details of the fourth movie because there's so much that goes on that it's honestly an experience. But it's... It's a heavy movie for what it deals with, and it is one of the most violent Rambo movies ever made, which kind of outdoes what happened in in the previous film, where it held the Guinness record for most violent movie in 1990, and then 20 years later, Sylvester Stallone basically said, hold my beer, and then upped the ante on a scale of 1 to 10, he went to like an 11 for the violence in that movie, and even though it's a very hectic thing, it does show Rambo still has his skills. He's still a one-man army, even in his age, that he was able to save all of the Christian mercenaries and even his own men and the uh, rescue team. And honestly, throughout the entire Rambo movie, it does feel like a fitting ending to his character. You do see that he can take care of himself. He can survive anything. But what's going to happen to him afterwards? The fourth movie to Rambo ends with Rambo coming back to the States to go see his father, which honestly, that's a nice bookend for his character. The first movie came up with Rambo coming back to the States to find his way in society again. And now that he's gone through all these missions and been in this country, now he's prepared to go back home. It wasn't like before. So this is nice that he knows where he's going. He wants to go back to be with his family. But then you had the fifth movie, and I have feelings about that. So in the fifth movie, I didn't really want to see it. And I'm a big Rambo fan. Rambo runs in my family. But the fourth movie just summed everything up. So it felt like it was unnecessary to see what else is to Rambo's character. That should be it. And the rumors of the fifth Rambo film originally was going to have Rambo pairing up with his father to go fight the Mexicans, which it's like, okay, all right, that's, um, that's a plot. That is definitely a plot, but just doesn't really seem all that great. They kept the plot, but they scrapped it to have it that Rambo has to go save his niece from a Mexican cartel. I mean... Honestly, that doesn't sound like a Rambo movie. That just sounds like any kind of Stallone movie. If you look at the entirety of Sylvester Stallone's career, you can put him in any action plot and it can be a Stallone movie. But there's a difference between a Stallone movie and that Stallone being in a Rambo movie. The plots of the action in Rambo does not align with the action movies that Stallone does, which gives the identity to the film, and it also does solidify uh, Stallone being taken seriously as Rambo and to tell him apart from his other roles. With this one, it doesn't feel like Rambo. There were many changes to Rambo's character. One being the fact that he's not with his father. At the end of the fourth film, there was the thought that he's going to be living with his father, helping him out, and then his father wasn't there. It turns out it was his father's friend, just a woman that's living in his family home, and the woman has a granddaughter. So for the past 10 years, they've all been taking care of each other, and he considers this girl as his niece. It does give Rambo this role of being a father because he never married, he never had kids of his own, and there's like an unspoken bond that he does have with some of the children that he has encountered in the countries that he's lived with. There's this small kid on the boat in the third Rambo movie that uh, helps out Rambo during his fights, and there's also this small child that reaches for a fish that Rambo caught for him so he can have some meals to give his family. 
He's good with kids. He's great. And this is a positive point to the fifth movie that it is nice to see him have this relationship of being like a father figure to this girl. And for the amount of time that's passed, he spent probably about 10 years raising this girl, teaching her how to horseback ride. And you know that he taught her some definite military skills with him being a military man and all, which is very nice. So she's set. But unfortunately, the Rambo movie has to Rambo and she's in danger. And that's where the whole plot of the film comes up is she's kidnapped by the Mexican cartel. And naturally, Rambo has to save her. However, this point that I'm going to talk about, it's not technically the first tragic thing that's happened in a Rambo movie. And oftentimes when you see tragedy happen to characters, it has to happen to characters. Sometimes you can't save the day. Not everyone can be saved. It's unfortunate. It happens in real life. And it happens in this film where... Unfortunately, by the time he gets to her and gets her in the car and takes her back home, she dies. She was pumped up with so much drugs that it just killed her whole system and it devastates Rambo. He couldn't save her. It's a hard thing to see in this film where Rambo is really unstoppable. He's gotten through the worst situations between the first film where he had an entire military regime after him and the second film where there was an entire village of soldiers after him in the third movie where there was a whole army after him and then the fourth movie which was everything in the kitchen sink coming after him and then this happens and it's worse than anything that's ever happened in the other movies and it's just another tragedy for him among the other people that he's lost. Some of the people that you've seen in the movie that he's mourned for, and also the ones that you never saw. There's so much tragedy in Rambo's life, and unfortunately, it doesn't get easy for him. But the only thing Rambo can do is what Rambo does best, and that's to get revenge. And it isn't entertaining to see, I have to admit. When you see Rambo get revenge, it is very justified and... It is intriguing to see what is he going to do to get back at this cartel. How is this cartel going to regret kidnapping his niece? And Rambo does do what it, it does best. It makes all these explosions and all these traps. And he goes all out for getting back at these people. But the one thing I thought about during this entire movie, I wasn't even 20 minutes in and I'm like, this is how Rambo ends? Rambo really should have ended at the fourth film when he comes back home and you just know that he's going to be okay. He's back in the States. He's, he's good. He's got his family. Or he'll just live a quiet, peaceful life. But it's Rambo. He's never going to have a quiet, peaceful life, unfortunately. So this does kind of open it up that no matter what happens, he's going to lose people or danger's going to come to him. And it does happen with some certain action characters where you know that, but with Rambo, it's just kind of sad where, damn, like, I wanted to have a happy ending for Rambo at least, or something that you knew he was going to be content. It was just an odd film to see. And what's even worse with this final Rambo movie is the fact that the original writer of Rambo despises the film. David Morell and Sylvester Stallone were pretty close in the series that they did together with making Rambo on the big screen and going all the way from First Blood, First Blood Part 2, Rambo 3, and then Rambo, and then this one, ugh, like, I don't blame David Morrell for being dissatisfied and not liking the way the film and vocalizing it for what happened. It shouldn't have happened in the first place. There were some good parts to the final Rambo movie, but it just didn't do a lot of justice to Rambo's character. I had to talk about it because I can't not talk about it with the fact that I'm covering all the Rambo movies. And it's up to you what you feel about it if you watch this film and there might be some things to see about it. And who knows, maybe in time that there will be a appreciation for the fifth Rambo film because some of the other Rambo films weren't appreciated back then and then eventually were shown to a higher positive recognition it just needs time, but right now it's just 
not a great thing to have. Last bud really should be last blood, and let's hope it stays that way. There's a lot to Rambo's character that makes him iconic, but it also needs to be said about who he is as a character, which is why I wanted to do all of this detail about him in this episode. I've been talking with my friends about how the PTSD in this movie truly is something to look at, to be shown to people about the definitions of PTSD and what someone goes through. And it is a very impressive movie series. If you do ever buy this series, I highly recommend that you watch it in survival mode because you learn more about Rambo, his character, his military skills, and it also tells you stuff about like certain military tactics, which is pretty interesting. It makes it a little bit further than just learning about the character. The Rambo series is iconic. There's a lot to learn from Rambo. There's a lot that Rambo has done for many people. There's a lot that Rambo teaches. It's more than just being an action series. The character of Rambo defines what it's like to go through PTSD, what it's like to be on your own. How are you going to survive? The main theme of this song is a song called It's a Long Road, and the entire song is about Rambo's character. If you look up the song and listen to it, you do see it is entirely about Rambo. And you can take that song in any context for what people go through, as they do have to learn to live on their own, and they have to survive on their own. It does show that insight to what it's like to have to survive, to develop relationships with people, and then you never know if they're gone. Rambo defines the cinema culture, but it also defines humanity. So this was an extremely long episode. I think this is the longest one to date. This has been a very interesting special about a very important character that I have talked about numerously, and I'm glad that I got the opportunity to talk about Rambo in this episode and change it up completely. I really enjoyed doing this episode. There will be another one that I will probably do in the future about another character. Thank you so much for listening to this long episode. And if you would like to see more about movies, you can follow me on TikTok at The Mystical Space Switch, where I make funny videos about movies. You might need to watch some funny stuff after I did this episode, because this was a lot of emotional stuff to talk about. And... If you would also like to see what I talk about with movies, I do write some articles on Vocal, and I will link that in the description box. But before I go, so if you are new to the show, I have a mystery system that determines my next episode. I put a whole bunch of pieces of paper in a bowl, and I mix it up, and that determines what the next episode is going to be. So let me get this mixed up real good. And let me, okay, let me go ahead and, okay, okay, I got one, I got one, I got one, I got one. Oh, I got two. Wait, drop that. Let's see here. Let me get this going. Oh my gosh. Well, look at this. We have a classic movie coming up for the next episode on the Screen Queen. The next episode is going to be about who framed Roger Rabbit. Wow, that is such a change after the past two episodes talking about like like really dark materials and heavy topics. This is nice to have that change. Oh, I'm looking forward to doing this episode. This is going to be great. Thank you so much for your support on the show. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, stay amazing because you are so cool. Alrighty, this is your screen queen signing off. Bye-bye!